How many of you have heard about the snowstorm on the East Coast? <laughs> yeah. How many of you have seen pictures of the snowstorm on the East Coast? My niece and my sister live in Virginia. My niece uh, lives on a uh, ranch in Virginia, and she's been sending us pictures. One of the pictures she sent us uh, it looked like there were some boxes or something out in the snow. It was like snow like this, and she said, well, how many cars are in the picture? <laughs> <laughs> Turned out there was a truck and two cars. <laughs> like, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, so that, that, and I said, well, I hope you're staying inside. She said, no, I've got all the animals I have to keep feeding. So she's having to figure out a way to get across all that snow just to the, and find her way over to the little barn area and feed the animals. Uh, it's, it's amazing the amount of snow that's falling back there. Uh, and, but by the way, how many of you are, can have a, a sense of excitement for Denver, New England, um, Jacksonville, or Arizona? Anyone? Denver. Thank you, Peter. Okay. A couple of you? Just sort of? Okay, well, I'm wearing red today. Does anybody know why? Thank you, sir. <laughs> Cardinal red. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> um, hey. There's a whole ton of teams didn't make it this far, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> and regardless of the outcome of the games, you can count on the fact that people who are excited about Denver, New England, Jacksonville, or Arizona, they will be talking about what they saw and heard this afternoon. Right? They'll especially be talking if their team wins. They'll probably still be talking about the, what they saw and heard if their teams don't make it to the victory stand, right? And, but two teams are going to make it next week, two weeks, excuse me, to the Super Bowl. And they'll be talking about that. Now, if your team doesn't make it, most of you will care less <laughs> about who wins that. But those people who are excited about their team, if it be Jacksonville, New England, uh, Denver, or Arizona, go red, um, they'll be talking about their team to somebody. Because what will they be sharing? They will be sharing what they've seen and what they've heard. Amen. You won't hold them back, will you? I mean, how hard can it be if your team wins for you to talk about it? <laughs> if something good happens to you, how hard can it be to tell somebody else about it? And that's exactly what John is going to describe for us today as we look at the introduction to the letter of John, written by John the Apostle, that beloved, the disciple who survives on the island of Patmos, exiled there because he's been preaching for Jesus Christ. And in 1 John chapter 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we write this to make our joy complete. John says, we're going to tell you about what we've seen and what we've heard. Uh, we are at the fourth week of our mission statement. Mission statement that says that we are trying to put legs to faith. The L stands for loving God and loving one another. The E stands for encouraging one another. And that's a, that, that responsibility we have to help, help each other, um, even to avoid sin, Hebrews said. The G stands for growing as Christ's disciples. We have responsibility to go into all the world, preach the gospel, making disciples of all nations, right? Mm -hmm. And every people group. And to share with them Jesus Christ so that they can then follow and obey him. And, and every one of us should have somebody that we are discipling and somebody who's helping us grow closer to Christ. And then today we're at the fourth part of that mission statement, sharing Jesus. Sharing Jesus. It's interesting that we've used that word, sharing. Notice we, we haven't said forcing Jesus upon anybody, arguing with anybody about Jesus, convincing anybody about Jesus. It's simply about sharing what you've seen and what you've heard. 
Wiest, in his translation uh, of this passage, writes it this way, the first couple of verses. He says, That which was from the beginning, that, that which we have heard, with the present result that it is ringing in our ears. Okay, if, if you're going to be at one of those games and your team's winning, guess what? It's going to be ringing in your ears, the celebration at the end of the game when the Cardinals win. Sorry, Chief. <laughs> he left, see? He left. Because I'm wearing scarlet red, he left. <laughs> it's going to be ringing in your ears at which we have discerningly seen with our eyes with the present result that it is, it is in our mind's eye. There's things that you, if I was to strike a nerve right now, your, your mind would suddenly open up all kinds of pictures of some event that you've been at, something that you've experienced because he, he's saying, we, we, in, in his explanation here, he says, we've, we've looked at things with discerning eyes. We've really evaluated these things, John says, and in discerning them, oh my, my mind is just alive. And, and think about that. What, was, what were the disciples remembering? Stephen Cole says that the, the phrase seen with our eyes shows that, shows that John is not talking about a mystical vision of Christ, but of actually watching Jesus as he lived before them. These were the guys. John's one of these men. He says, I, I watched him as he fed the 5,000, as he kept breaking the bread, and he kept breaking and kept breaking, and, and pretty soon there was so much that we were all filled over to overflowing, we had a ton left over. He said, I watched as he walked on the water. We saw him standing out there. We saw him inviting Peter to come overboard. We, we saw him pulling Peter out of the water. We watched him on the water. We watched him heal the sick and the cast out the demons. We, we saw him touch that leper and, and the leprosy just left. We saw him bring that man uh, up from the ground and, and start walking. We saw him raise people from the dead. We saw it. John's been so affected by it. He says, we, we gazed upon it as a spectacle. And then listen, listen. And our hands handled with a view to investigation. Our hands handled with a, a view to investigation. What did Jesus say to Thomas? Thomas, come here. You said you wouldn't believe unless you did what? Put your hand in my side. And touched the place where the nails went in. So he says, come Thomas. Come touch. And John's saying, I saw Thomas touch. I touched him. We ate with him. We talked with him. And we watched him ascend up into heaven. We've seen these things. We've looked at them gazingly. We've investigated them with our very hands. And it's truth, folks. <clears throat> you see, the disciples... They shared what they saw and heard. That's all they did. They simply told people, here's what we saw, here's what we heard, here's what we've experienced. John the Baptist was in prison. He's about to die. And he sends message to Jesus and he says, I just need to make sure. I want to make sure that I haven't missed it. The Holy Spirit told me that the one who I baptized with water and I saw his heaven open and if I saw a dove land on them and the Spirit of God come upon them, that that was the Messiah. And I saw that happen with you, but I just need to make sure, are you the Messiah? And here Jesus responded in Luke 7. He says, so he replied to the messengers who had come asking him, he says, go back and report to John what you have, what? Seen and heard. And then he says, the blind receive sight the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Amen. And John will celebrate. This is the Messiah because of what they've seen and heard. Peter said it this way. In fact, you might remember that when he's there in front of the court of the Sanhedrin, they've been ordering him to stop talking about Jesus. And he says, we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. In 2 Peter, Peter said it this way, for we did not follow cleverly, this is 2 Peter 1, 16 to 19, we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love and I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We're not making this up, folks. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. It says, and, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. For prophecy never had its origin in human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We've seen it. We've seen the fulfillment of the prophecies that have been all throughout the Old Testament. We've seen the truth come alive. The word of life is right here in front of us and we've seen it and God has spoken to us. Luke even later recounting what he had experienced as he met the disciples and they told him the stories. He says in Luke 1, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among you just as they were handed down to us by those who, who were the first eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account to you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. We've seen this, we've heard this, and the evidence is there. It's true. In an article from Christian Faith, it discusses the importance of the early record for, the, for what we believe. And it says, one of the biggest arguments against the Christian faith is that the resurrection story is a myth that developed over as much as a century after Jesus was crucified on a Roman cross. People would say, oh, it's just a myth. He didn't really rise from the dead. You know, but just you know, 100 or more years later, they started telling this story that he rose from the dead, but it wasn't true. It was originally thought that the gospel accounts were written as much as 100 years after Jesus walked on the earth. However, recent scholarship and manuscript reliability and textual criticism now places the gospels at 30 to 50 years after Jesus. Now, why, why is that significant? Because biblical scholars using the historical records of Paul and his early travels to Damascus and Jerusalem place the teachings of Paul at about 35 A.D. Just three to five years after the death of Christ. This is dramatic because those same scholars would hold that this basic creed for the Christian faith developed far too quickly for a myth to develop and distort the historical record of the resurrection. What are we saying? Okay, you might have a myth that develops 100 years down the road. But three years after Jesus rose from the dead, a myth doesn't develop that fast. Paul shares what he has seen and heard. Acts 22, in, in, as he's talking about his testimony and he's trying to lead this leader of the Roman world to Christ, he says, you will, he says, God told me you will be his witness to all men of what, Paul? Of what you've seen and what you've heard. And then in 1 Corinthians, here's what Paul says. Chapter 15, verses 3 to 11. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. This is the stuff that Paul saw and he's saying this just happened three years ago. That, that according to the scriptures, he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. Folks, We've got guys here, this is what Paul's saying. We've got guys here who experienced this. They saw it. They can tell you whether it's true or not. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. 
But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Jesus died, rose from the dead, and he's alive right now. What does Paul do? Paul regularly, and you see it throughout Acts, you see it throughout the, the, the letters, Paul shares his story. Talks about what happened to him. He's not afraid to say, I was a bad guy. I really messed up with God. But God changed my life. He shares what he did wrong openly. He's, he's simply clear about it. Look at me. And then he shares what Jesus did for him. How Jesus met him and changed his life. And he shares the difference so that people can see it. It's very obvious. Question. Have you seen and heard Jesus. You see, if you have, then tell your story. How hard can it be to simply tell people what you've seen and what you've heard? As I mentioned already, thousands of people will be talking about a football game as if that really is more significant than life. Just as many, and maybe more, are talking about the gigantic snowstorm on the East Coast. And sending their pictures. Go on Facebook. Look online and at all the images that are out there. How hard can it be to share your story of what you've seen and heard? Uh, by the way, I, I've given you a tool. Open up your worship bulletin. There's a half sheet in there. I know there's several. <laughs> Which means there's several tools for you today. But one of those tools in there says my story on it. And if you look at it, it's a simple way. It actually uh, is something that I borrowed from um, Bonita Baptist Church. They actually give this out to people who are going to share their testimony during a worship celebration. And I thought, wow, this is really great. This, this kind of gets it down to the point of how do we share our story? The first thing is write it out. Have you ever just written down on, and tried to do this on one page? That way you could share your story in five minutes or less. <laughs> okay. On one page, just write out your story. And here's the outline that you want to write down. Okay, uh, my name is Bill, and this is my story. Before I came to, to, became a Christian, share specifically how you lived and what you thought before you met Jesus Christ. I, I, I like the, the note that they put down there. It says, some people became Christians when they were very young. They don't really have a before Christ to talk about. That's fine, but you could still speak of the difference Christ has made in your life. Okay, so you, you became a Christian when you're three years old. So you didn't do all that nasty bad stuff in those first three years. <laughs> so kind of unusual to come to Christ at three years old, but I've, it could happen. Okay? So, but you still can share because you've lived a life since then and you haven't been perfect all along that journey and what difference has Christ made for you because you've been living for Christ? Share that. Secondly, tell specifically how... You made the choice to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because you see, you can't do it by your mother and your father. You can't do it because somebody else. You can't do it because you're an American. You can't do it just because you're a Baptist or you go to church. You have to make that personal decision to say, I'm going to follow Christ. How did you do that? Thirdly, sh share what's your life been like since you trusted Christ. Now you're telling people about your experience. This is what's happened to me because I believe and have followed Jesus Christ. Fourthly, aim for a short amount. That's probably about one single space sheet of paper. And just share that. Be prepared, Peter says, be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. And this is a simple tool just to help you do that. Tell your story. I gotta tell you, people can argue with you theology all the time. Okay? And, and if you try to argue anybody into the kingdom of God, you're probably going to experience what Paul did where he finally said, forget it. <laughs> he was arguing in the pantheon. He was right there in Greece. He's trying to argue people into believing. He said, it doesn't work. So he says, I'm just going to talk about Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead. And he talks about what Jesus has done to him. He, starts, he just tells his story. Don't try to argue. 
tell your story. Question, with whom will you share Jesus? I'd love for your mind to wander right now and the people that you spend time with, the people that you're connected to, family members, friends, neighbors, co-workers, people in what we refer to as your oikos, your household. Remember in the, in the um, New Testament days, uh, the oikos was a household where people lived. It included family, included um, unmarried um, adults who were continuing to live there. It might be extended family members. There could be aunts and uncles, grandparents and all that would also be living there. The oikos also included the servants and the workers. And, and then the household, the oikos was open to anybody in the community. You could come and eat, eat there with the people in that household. That's your oikos. Well, who's your oikos? Who are, think about this. Who are you connected with? Who do you spend at least an hour a week with? Some of you, well, I spend more time on the computers. I'm not with people. Who are you connecting with on the computer? computer. Who do you spend that time with? And whom, with whom are you willing to share Jesus Christ? I probably should be asking you the opposite question. Who do you spend time with that you're willing to say, I don't care whether they go to hell or not? Who do you spend time with that you would say, I don't, I, I'm not going to share my story. I'm not going to waste my energy. I'm not going to take the time. I'm afraid. I don't know how to say it. I don't know what to do. So I'm just not going to tell them. And I'm going to let them go to hell. Well, Bill, you're kind of brutal, aren't you? Folks, there's, it's heaven or hell. What do you want for people? With whom will you share your story? Will you share Jesus with Folks, shouldn't we be thankful for the person who shared Jesus with us? Somebody took the energy. I don't know who it was, but you do. In each of our lives, somebody spent some time with us to help us see Jesus Christ. Maybe it was great, great grandma who prayed to her dying breath that, that you would come to believe in Jesus. Maybe it was some neighbor. Maybe it was some coworker. Maybe it was your spouse. But somebody shared Jesus with you. Who was that person? Thank God for that person. And the fact that they, they were willing to share what they'd seen and what they'd heard. <clears throat> Twyla Brickman talks about us sharing with the people that are part of our lives, our oikos, and she says this. Inviting people to come to something is never a substitute for building relationships. New Testament evangelism is always more about going into their world than bringing them into ours. Most unbelievers became Christians because someone just knew, related to, prayed for, loved, modeled, and shared with them. God does the work of conviction. You have fun being a friend. Friends share what is important to them with their friends. In your worship bulletin is a prayer sheet. Several pictures are on it. It's an opportunity for you to pray for it. Patrick's there. By the way, Patrick, on your website, I need a picture of Rose. It is on, on, on. I couldn't find it. Okay. It's on the home page right there. Well, I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it, brother. So maybe it's, so I'll look for it. <laughs> but pray for our missionaries because they're sharing Jesus and telling their stories in other languages and other places. Look at that. I try to give little short descriptions of each of our missionaries. Take that with you today and start praying for our missionaries who are trying to share Jesus. It's another way for you to share Jesus with, with people around the world. Just like we're supporting Patrick, there's others there as well. <laughs> Folks, when we share our faith, our love will grow. 
we need to really question our love relationship with God if we're not sharing our faith. If we're unwilling or afraid or whatever to tell the story and to tell anybody else about Jesus, we need to question our love for God. When we share our faith, we encourage other people to grow, don't we? We need to examine our love for other people if we're unwilling to share our faith with them. You'll be amazed at how much you will grow. <laughs> Shared this with, I think, someone in our life group yesterday. You'll be amazed at how much you'll grow when you start teaching somebody else, when you start sharing Jesus with somebody else, and they start asking you questions, and you have to answer, I don't know, but let me find out. You'll be amazed, and we need to test our ministry if we're not sharing our faith. Did you know that if you will share your faith, God will change people's lives. We need to see whether we really believe in God and whether we're willing to follow Him into those divine appointments. I, I gotta ask you the question, it's the title of the message. How hard can it be? How hard can it be to tell people what you've seen and heard? There's a gift for you on the, on the chairs this morning. It's the book of life. Or the life book, excuse me. The life book. The life book. It's from the Gospel of John, incidentally, in the special, uh, more modern translation. But look around the room. Do you see more than the ones that are on the chair that, where you're seated? You should see about 300 of them spread around the room. They're back there on the shelf. They're over here on the bench. They're on the tables over there when you get coffee. We're not going to let you forget this. They're on the, the table there before you go out the door. Guess why they're there? Because we need Alice to have something to dust next week. <laughs> no, because they're meant for you to take with you and give away. Now notice, the worst thing that could happen is for you to take a stack and stuff them in a closet someplace. <laughs> okay? The second worst thing would be for them just to stay where they're at. <laughs> All of these books need to go today. <coughs> and you need to take them and give them to somebody. S but now note, to somebody who doesn't know God loves them. <laughs> Share Jesus. And maybe before you even give it, you need to earn the right to give them that book. You need to spend some time with them. You need to start praying for them by name. You need to look for opportunities just to get to know them better. You need to hear their story so that then you earn the right to share your story with them. And after you've had them into your house, after you've spent some time with them, after you've gotten to know them, then give them the books. You know, some of you may leave them on your tables this afternoon when you go to lunch somewhere. If you do, make sure you tip triple. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the tip. This is the extra gift, okay? <laughs> Don't you dare be, be stingy. <laughs> I gave you a book. Well, it's worth, you know, eternity. That's right. <laughs> but for a person who might not know Jesus yet, you've just really show, told them that they don't matter. So look for the ways that you can share Jesus and your story. Amen. What did the disciples say? John says, I want to tell you what I saw and what I heard so you can experience it too. Oh my how hard can it be? Let's pray. Even the quietest among us talks to somebody about something that's important, that God. Even the shyest, maybe on Facebook or some other social media, through a text, an email, or a conversation out on the street while shoveling snow or something else, we have conversations with other people. There are things that, that matter to us that we will talk about. 
And if we look back on those experiences, we'll see that we've been sharing about something that we saw, something that we heard, something we experienced, and we share that with someone else. Jesus, forgive us if we don't also share what we've seen, what we've heard, and what we've experienced with you. And help us, dear Lord, to recognize those times that it's the power of darkness that wants us to be afraid. And you've said perfect love drives out fear. Help us to know that you have a perfect love for us and help us to have a perfect love for the people around us so that we will not give in to the fear that wants to keep us from talking and sharing what we've seen and heard. God, help us not to decide whether somebody is going to go to heaven or not. Let us give them the opportunity. And Jesus, if anyone is here today who've never taken that step, they've seen, they've heard, and it's time to say, yes, I believe I'm going to follow Jesus. If you've never done that, I invite you to say yes to Jesus today. And when you do, tell somebody else here, before you leave here this morning, I said yes to Jesus. Now, God, how hard can it be? It cost you heaven and life on that cross. Oh, Jesus, help us to share what we've seen and heard in Jesus' name.